My name is Shahid Rafiq. Um, I'm uh, a neurologist and stroke specialist here in Frederick, Maryland, USA. Um, I'm also the chair of Apna Merit. Um, Apna Merit is um, uh, Merit is the committee of Apna. As you know, Apna is the association of uh, pa physicians of Pakistani descent of North America, uh, and Merit it, uh, is its committee which focuses on medical education and healthcare in Pakistan. Um, and we have done various lectures. Uh, we have um, initiated various projects, including uh, a collaboration with CS uh, CPSP to open up new specialties such as child psychiatry, um, intensive care, as well as ER over the past uh, about 13 years. A merit committee started 2007, and I'm glad that um, um, Rizwan Naim is one of uh, the main speaker today, is also one of the founder member of this committee. And we joined together when uh, Dr. Nahid Usmani, who is the current uh, president of APNA, um, started this committee in 2007. Um, today, we actually have a very esteemed panel uh, with a very difficult and special topic of uh, testing the um, testing um, COVID-19 uh, disease. Uh, this pandemic has taken uh, the world by storm and uh, both Pakistan and USA, uh, it has uh, the main focus. Of course, USA has uh, led in terms of um, uh, the number of cases and and the number of deaths in the world, but uh, and Pakistan, which so far have been um, safer, um, also uh, in the recent times have been picking up cases and deaths. So, um, with that, I will um, uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Shahid Parvez, who is the uh, president. Um, elect of Pakistan Association of Pathologists. Um, and uh, he will then introduce uh, Dr. Zara Hassan, who's a professor of pathology in Aga Khan University, uh, and Dr. Rizwan Naim, who's the associate of uh, pathology in Albert Einstein College of uh, Medicine uh, uh, and uh, Montefiore Medical Center, New York. So with that, I will hand out over to um, Dr. Shahid Parvez for the rest of this um, um, session to uh, introduce the speakers as well as moderate the questions later on. Um, Dr. Shahid Parvez, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shahid Rafiq, uh, for your kind uh, introduction and kickoff. Uh, so it's indeed, uh, my privilege to have uh, such learned people like Professor Dr. Rizwan Naim. Uh, many of us know him for a very long time. And he is, uh, you know, professor of pathology, molecular pathology in particular, uh, at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and consultant at Montefiore Medical Center. And for years and years, you know, I mean, he has been so uh, helpful uh, in helping the various institutions, various individuals uh, that, uh, you know, I will need, we will need a, a separate session to <laughs> enumerate that. So thanks, uh, uh, Professor Rizwan, to be with us uh, uh, to talk about today about this uh, invisible, but we may term invisible enemy but a very big enemy, you know, and, and it uh, reminds us, you know, when the 19th century, you know, when people like uh, Jenner and Pasteur and Koch, you know, I mean, they, they were, uh, you know, initially working uh, against uh, these microorganisms and viruses and all those things, you know, the history is being repeated. And we also have with us uh, our a uh, colleague, uh, Professor Zara Hassan, who is a molecular uh, biologist, molecular pathologist, 
and she is also the uh, president of the Pakistan Society of Molecular Pathology. And I, you know, uh, is a professor actually of histopathology and working at Aga Khan University Hospital for about 30 years now, you know. And uh, I am also a counselor of CPSP currently and uh, um, uh, currently president elect of Pakistan Association of Pathologists. You know, this is the oldest uh, uh, society of all pathologists of Pakistan, you know. It's an umbrella for all the pathologists, whether molecular pathologists or histopathologists or microbiologists or virologists or hepatologists or so on. So uh, we are very pleased. I am very pleased that, you know, uh, all of you are here. And uh, let me request uh, Professor uh, uh, Rizwan Naim to please uh, start with the uh, because there are so many questions and answers. And, uh, you know, pathologists are called doctors, doctors. So, you know, when eventually everyone falls back to the pathologist. And at this time, uh, at the forefront are the, you know, molecular pathologists, virologists, microbiologists. So there will be so many things, I'm sure, that uh, people are looking forward to. Assalamualaikum, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I think I have to highlight three organizations who have done phenomenal work in many, many years. One is uh, uh, Apna, Apna Merit, and Shahid Rafiq has been uh, spearheading this for many years now. And I was fortunate to be the co-chair with, uh, with Dr. Nahid Usmani when we started this in 2007. So, and then Pakistan Association of Pathologists, who uh, Dr. Shahid uh, 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 just mentioned briefly, it's one of the oldest organization in Pakistan of medical profession. Not only that, they are doing a phenomenal work to introduce molecular pathology in Pakistan. And now every Pakistan Association of Pathology meeting is complemented or uh, co-attended co by molecular pathologists in Pakistan also. Zara is uh, Zara Hassan is, uh, uh, is a professor at Al Khan, and uh, one more uh, relevance to me is she's a daughter of my beloved professor, Dr. Zaki Hassan, and uh, she is head head of molecular pathology in in Pakistan, and has coordinated many many sessions and many programs in Pakistan to introduce molecular pathology. So with that esteemed group, my talk is short today. What we wanted to really hear, just clear some concept in, uh, in, uh, in coronavirus testing. The topic is really making sense of virus testing. There is so much confusion out there and it's better to know and, uh, and have some authentic information to everyone who is dealing with these issues. So humans are introduced this is not the first time I would say that humans are introduced with this virus. This is a family of viruses, which uh, the most recent one is H1N1 also. And they migrate from, uh, from some, uh, uh, some they, are, they are present in many different animals, but they migrate with the intermediate host and change themselves or mutate themselves and then uh, comes to human. So, so the two beta coronaviruses we call it, are more severe, uh, cause more severe disease and outbreaks. SARS-CoV-2, as uh, we have uh, seen in 2002 and 2003, and with uh, uh, almost 8,100 8, cases and about 774 deaths. And then uh, we also have seen MERS virus, which is also a family of uh, coronavirus, with similar deaths in 2012. But the, the new one really falls into beta, also falls into beta coronavirus genes and is the seventh coronavirus identified to infect human. And this has caused a lot more problems than we have seen before. So it is, it is we are still in the beginning of, of this virus, uh, uh, tracking and virus uh, uh, pandemic, as it was only March 11 when WHO announced 
that it is a pandemic, what pandemic mean that now it is spreading all seven continents of, uh, of, uh, of this world. And uh, <clears throat> it's, its name, you know, you can call it being different names, but SARS-CoV-8 and COVID-19 is a disease. Uh, and uh, uh, COVID-19 is the name of the virus and SARS-CoV is a disease severe acute respiratory syndrome due to COVID-2 uh, uh, virus. So I would just give you a latest snapshot because these numbers, as you know, is changing every day. But I was thinking yesterday, this is from yesterday and uh, uh, by, by end of the day, I guess. So it, it, a high plateau has been reached and, uh, and what high plateau means that virus is leveling off at the higher plateau and what it means that it is more infectious, more spread is coming as we move forward. And roughly half of the states now in US are relaxing lockdown. So, in my opinion, what it means that uh, it, we might see another surge of uh, infections and disease by end of this month. So the, some of the numbers are more than 25 new infections nearly every day in April, 25,000 every day in April. And that clip that does not seem to be dropping in May, we have very similar numbers, 20 to 25,000 in May also. Because of limited testing capacity in US also, yes, that may be a surprise to you, but US has suffered seriously because lack of, lack of testing and still is lack of testing is an issue. It's a political issue, it's a community issue, it's a hospital issue. We just, I do this testing in our lab and we just can't get the uh, kits we need to have. And, and, and that, is, that is why we are not getting the test done, which we need to get tested. So this is a cry, a far cry from all of us in medical community to get these testing, as much testing done as possible. So we know uh, what, what, what the status is. So more than 1000 people have died each day in the United States since April 2nd. And as early as Tuesday and Wednesday this week, the toll topped 2,000 individual death in the United States. So it's not going away at present. COVID-19 now killed over 76,000 because I checked the number this morning also, 76,000 in US, but experts warned that because of testing shortage again, the actual toll could be much higher. It's probably a substantial underestimate of the true number of tens of thousand. This was not me, this is said by epidemiologist at the Yale University. So Pakistan also suffering from lack of testing, which Zara is going to talk about as, as we really wanted to know how, how, what is the current situation in Pakistan is and which direction we are going. So most recently, again, Texas, which is one of the big states in the United States has uh, lifted, uh, uh, oh sorry, has reported that new cases more new cases, what they have typically seen in, in mid-April now seeing in May. What it means, they are just peaking at the different times. So they are different state, different region of United States are peaking at different sites. There are cases accelerating and increasing in Kansas, another important state in the Midwest. But outbreak continues to build up. But this outbreaks in United States actually are, we are seeing more and more in prisons, meat processing plants, and as recently as this week, a model released by Columbia University in New York, which analyzed if we are, as we are releasing and loosening this uh, lockdown uh, orders, there, is, there will be a resurgence of cases by the end of May. So we are here for a long haul at present. So the pandemic is not going to settle down until there is a sufficient population immunity slightly above 50%, we all know that. This was done, said by epidemiologist Gabriel Ewing of the University of Hong Kong and at the New York Academy of Science briefing. Since the world is far from the level of immunity, uh, that is, we are, we are still seeing a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of damage and carnage due to that. But one important thing, 
is this the virus is going to keep finding people it's going to keep spreading through the population and that said means we are not in for a long haul so this is another three different model proposed that we might see an, a big wave or tsunami type of wave of this uh, virus as we move forward. There might be similar type of waves that we have seen now and slowly it will taper down or if we really control our, uh, our uh, staying home uh, practice and social isolation practice, so social distancing practice, we will see, we have seen this big uh, uh, wave and now the waves are going to keep staying smaller and smaller and we deal with it. So three potential futures of COVID-19, recurring small outbreaks, as we mentioned, and, and uh, uh, a world will be a very different place uh, 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 as we move forward. So as you carry your cell phone, you will be carrying a mask with you to protect yourself and protect others. And workplace will be hot zone because that's where most of the people come together. And public transportation, which used to be uh, uh, championed as environmentally correct, may not be personally correct and may be dangerous. So things will change dramatically. I'm going to leave this slide for Zara to explain, but basically what it's saying is different type of testing is done at different type, different time frame, and that's where you get the most benefit out of it. I'm just going to talk about uh, why and how should we get tested? So molecular tests, and, and there are three different tests as you can see in the slide. Molecular test, antibody test, and now most recent one, we, we, we call it antigen testing. So to detect what molecular tests really do, it detects the genetic material, which is RNA in this virus, uh, in the sample which we are testing. And most of the sample types are nasopharyngeal swab, nasal swab or throat swab. And most recently, the saliva sample is also being tested in the United States. I don't know if that's the case in uh, Pakistan also, because what saliva does really is it eliminates the shortage or supply of uh, this throat swabs and uh, collecting materials, collecting devices we need for nasal swab and throat swab. So, so that, that is, that is, that is, so to detect, for, the, for the molecular test, remember what we are doing, we are just trying to detect if that RNA piece or RNA virus pieces we are amplifying by PCR are present in the sample or not. Then, then uh, antibody testing, or we call it serology test, to determine the antibodies. So whenever new virus enters your body, your body responds to it. We are, uh, with, with some antibody creation of a novel or new antibodies. And those antibodies initially try to fight off with this virus and then sometimes stays in the body for a, a period of time, maybe year, months or uh, whatsoever. And whenever that virus enters the body again, it fights and have a rapid response type of mechanism uh, from human body. So, so this test, which is antibody test, actually it, uh, it indicates you have been exposed to virus or not, mostly to help track the pandemic. Uh, and most, most importantly, it is used to track pandemic, like how the virus is, uh, uh, as, is spreading. And it is done by blood sample or a finger stick, basically. Then we hope that the antigen testing, so as you know, the PCR testing is a complex testing, complicated testing, and you, you need, uh, 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 you, it, it is expensive also. But we hope that antigen is like looking at protein of that virus in a sample. And if that test is developed rapidly, it can substantially, substantially increase the number of tests we can perform to know if that antigen which is, a, which is a piece of a virus or protein of a virus can be detected in the human body or sample we are testing. So this slides, I'm not going to go in detail, but basically tells you uh, is a real-time PCR or, uh, uh, or, or uh, 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 most tests so far for considered of the real-time PCR techniques against the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase E, there are different type of proteins like E is called envelope protein, N nucleo 
caspid spike protein and ORF1B transcript. And you can design your primers with one, uh, with the, as you may remember, there were some controversial issues that the WHO test was targeting one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, target. And then US said that, no, we need more than that. So uh, CDC developed two targets and then CDC kits was contaminated by for some reason. And so that's why in US, this met, this is, this, this uh, testing was delayed for a long, long time. But I, I, I also show in this slide that no matter what primers you use, your WHO, ORF1, or spike protein, or N protein, or E protein, you can, uh, most of these tests are very reliable and they are, they are targeting very specific genetic material of that virus to, to, to do that. And this slide shows that different parts of the country, different companies have developed this test and they all work very similarly. So now the, uh, when, now the question is, when should we get tested? And that's a question my kids ask all the time. So should we get tested? How can we test it? So my, my, my simple answer is, when you have symptoms or infection or have been exposed to someone with the virus, that's when you need a molecular test. Uh, you know, the second part is when is the antibody test? So when you had or suspected you had COVID-19 and, or you have a molecular test which was positive, and then, and wants to know if you have antibodies to that virus. So these are two different type of tests and done at different timing, as Zara will explain in her slides. So COVID-19 antibody testing, let's talk about this a little more. It means that you have infected with SARS-CoV-2 at one time uh, within last, uh, last few weeks or month. This may also mean that you are immune to virus, which is a good news and may not get severe symptom again, but we need more data for that. However, SARS-CoV is a new virus and there are still unanswered question about whether a previous infection or provides immunity and if so, for how long? As I mentioned that your body developed that immunity, but we don't know how long that immunity last. A negative antibody test, I got my testing done yesterday and it was negative, but that may not be a good news because that your immune system has not produced antibodies to the infection, which likely means that you have not been infected with virus previously. You can have a negative antibody test if you are tested too soon. So they are, you know, false negative and false positive. We'll be talk about uh, a little later, you can have a negative antibody test if you are tested too soon and your body has not yet produced enough antibodies. The CDC, Center for Disease Control, says it takes up to two weeks and maybe more to develop detectable antibodies, and it can be longer in some individuals. So what is what does the PCR test result mean? A positive PCR test mean, results mean that you have DNA or RNA material of that virus in the sample you're testing. A negative PCR means just opposite of that. So I, I'm going to stop here and if time permits, I'll come back to children's, but I'll hand over to Zara and she can tell us more uh, data from Pakistan, and then we can go into question answer sessions. And if people have a questions about children, because there's some confusion about uh, this virus in children, I'll come back. Zara, please, can you take over? Assalamu um, Thank you, Dr. Rizwan. Thank you, Dr. Shahid and Dr. Rizwan, both for the introduction. Um, so what I will do today is actually uh, follow on from uh, Dr. Rizwan's very nice presentation where he has introduced the, the state of COVID-19 disease in the US. He has um, talked about the virus and he's also talked about the diagnostic modalities. So um, what I will do is I will recap um, some specifics about diagnostics and then uh, bring us up to speed as to where we are um, in uh, the state of um, uh, testing in Pakistan and what we know about COVID-19, it's still early days yet. And um, we, so the, 
So um, a little bit about, as I said, an update on diagnostics with reference to Pakistan. So um, I will put this up um, because um, when it comes to who to test and not to test, um, the question is, what are the symptoms one should be looking for? And symptoms of COVID-19 have actually varied. Like as we learn more about this disease, um, initially the symptoms that were identified were, you know, cough, um, you know, a fever, uh, and a travel history. And then as the disease has changed and it has gone from a disease from travelers, certainly in Pakistan, to local transmission, the range of symptoms has also varied. So there's cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, muscle pain, and a new one, as Dr. Isvan pointed out a bit earlier to me, was diarrhea. So we are learning um, more about all the what what seem to be vague non-specific symptoms that need to be looked out at the clinical level and it is these people with who are symptomatic or those who uh, have been in contact with people who have been symptomatic compatible with COVID-19 that should have testing done for disease. So what kind of test and when should it be done? This is the big question. But if we look at the disease in terms of timelines, so, and, and we presume that this is a virus, it can take up to um, two weeks for the infection to develop. So this is a minus two week or a minus one. And, and the trouble is that before symptoms develop, it is the PCR-based test that is most likely to be positive. So it's the molecular test that will pick up the RNA of the virus that Dr. Zvan just described. And the antibody test, if you look here in this time frame, um, will pick up positivity or the, it'll pick up a host response to the virus, which starts at about 10 days or so, but in some people, it may not come up until three weeks after the infection. So this is why the antibody test is not reliable as a diagnostic. It may be used in an algorithm where it may be used, for example, in um, symptomatic cases that are PCR negative because, you know, if the viremia goes down, somebody has had COVID-19 disease, but they may now be making antibodies. So both tests have to be used with care. Um, now, what samples should be used for testing for RT-PCR? This slide is here because there's a lot of um, knowledge we're gaining about what kind of sample should be used. Respiratory sample collection has previously been something people have not been familiar with. Uh, for influenza testing, we used to use um, resp upper respiratory samples using a nasopharyngeal swab. You can collect them from a nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab. Um, and if the, in patients with pneumonia, you can collect a bronchoalveolar Lavard specimen. But the nasopharyngeal swab itself is um, a complex test in the sense that it requires a particular swab, a kind of swab that will go in through the nose and um, allows sampling of the nasopharynx. Um, and it is collected and put into a tube that co contains a medium called a viral transport medium that doesn't allow the virus to degrade. So a lot of the testing bottlenecks that have occurred in the US that have, are still occurring in Pakistan are related to the availability of these swabs because it is key to correct, collect the correct sample from the upper respiratory site in the early stage of infection and to collect it properly and use the correct transportation tube before it gets to the laboratory. And only after that can you can do the testing. So this sampling, the sampling site, the technique used, and the stage of infection are very important considerations for PCR testing. And um, in addition, the test detail is um, something I will talk about later, which is sensitivity of test, which allows um, you to understand what is the lower limit? How many viruses can be collected? And um, as Dr. Izvan showed, there's a whole range of tests that may work. People have developed them in the lab. They are now CIVD mark tests. Many of them have been FDA approved. Sensitivity is quite good. Um, some of them can detect as low as five virus copies 
but the viral load varies in individuals. It varies day to day. It varies depending on how well the sample has been collected. So those are all issues that may come up in the PCR testing. So coming to Pakistan, what is a little bit of, of background. So the first COVID-19 case was diagnosed in February uh, on the 26th. And the initial cases um, that we saw, so at the AKU, we started these, the diagnostics at that time um, and uh, worked with uh, the government to expand testing. And now we're working locally and regionally to do testing with um, a whole range of laboratories across the country. And we, we realized that while the initial cases were travelers from Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, and then UK and USA, subsequently, we saw local transmission from people who were in contact with those travelers. And then secondly, groups of people who were in congregations, religious congregations, um, some of them in contact with the travelers who had come carrying um, SARS-CoV infection. And now we're in a situation where the cases being diagnosed are in the general public and also in healthcare workers. So the situation has changed over the last two months quite a lot. So this is a situational report of as of May um, 8th, and it has a lot of stats here, but just to point out that in terms of numbers, so if we, if we look at 25,800 confirmed cases in Pakistan, in terms of numbers, they seem small because um, as we just heard in the US, that's the kind of cases you'll see each day. Uh, but whether or not it's um, reflective of the spectrum of disease or um, it's limited by the number of tests being done, we don't really know. Uh, we haven't peaked as yet. If you look at uh, the number of cases in the graph below, which is uh, looking at how cases are increasing over the month, there was, there's a case increase, which in terms of numbers is about 241 but it is continuing to increase. And the cases are being diagnosed mostly in uh, Sindh province, which is highlighted in green, and in Punjab. But then these are the regions where most of the testing is also being done. So to put things into context, how many tests are being done um, currently? Um, so we're, we're probably doing a few thousand tests a day, which varies from province to province. Um, and they're different laboratories, and the numbers of laboratories in different provinces also vary. So the largest concentration of laboratories doing the testing is in Punjab and Sindh. And uh, so similarly, that is related to the kind of coverage of testing there is. So the governments, both the provincial and the federal governments are, as you know, quite um, keen to scale up testing and to cover as much of the population as possible, but there are challenges. Um, and um, when it comes to here, I've put this up here um, in, in, to put things into perspective as to the questions that are being asked is how, what is the picture of mortality in Pakistan? So this is uh, a picture showing that most of the um, case fatality rate is the highest in the older age group, which is uh, 50 plus is 4% um, and then the highest in 80 plus and lowest in the younger age group. Um, so this is the current status. And then as we um, diagnose more and more cases and have more coverage of more regions of the country and more areas within large urban and rural areas, this might change. So this really is uh, a changing space. Um, so with that background, um, uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about lockdown. So Sindh has been in lockdown since March 23rd. So and now, um, so that's about six weeks. And Punjab and um, KPK and Balochistan have been partial lockdowns since April. Um, the discussions are about releasing these lockdowns as um, there are a lot of um, issues with the lockdowns, not just uh, about uh, people having trouble with healthcare access to other things. Um, there are concerns about people not having access to hospitals, uh, people with tuberculosis and HIV and chronic diseases who need to get to hospitals are unable to get to care. Uh, people on, um, who are daily wage earners 
are unable to um, earn their living. So um, it is a balancing act between um, restricting and maintaining social isolation and locking down regions and letting people um, intermingle again. So what is next? Like, um, like elsewhere in the world, um, usage of masks has increased. So a lot of people are using masks in public places. Um, SOPs are being established and social distancing is being encouraged. Um, Dr. Shahid said something about the, the social distancing and how it's effective in more, more disciplined uh, countries like Sweden. And uh, so the question is in Pakistan, how effective is social distancing and how possible is it when you have so many people living in, in a room and you don't have always the, um, the privilege of distancing. So as a result, um, there are isolation centers that um, people who have been unable to quarantine at home are being encouraged to stay at, but that those also remain limited. And um, so who should be tested? Testing should really be done in high and medium risk groups. Um, and ideally people who test positive should be isolated. What is the best way to do it? What model works in Pakistan? Um, we don't know yet. There is uh, a trap, you know, people are doing their best. Um, and now the new thing is, as coming back to what you mentioned about antibody studies, we have no idea what the scale of infection is in the population. And we need to have seroprevalence studies to understand how widespread SARS CoV infection is. So that's where we are at. These are things that are now being discussed. And once we have information about seroprevalence studies, we will have an idea how many of our um, population in different regions have actually been exposed to the virus. Because as you, as has been pointed out, many people who have virus infection remain asymptomatic. They may be carriers, they may be spreading the infections, they may bring it home. It has been shown that recently that um, most of the people who passed away the last week were people who were at home, actually, and possibly got infected from younger individuals that went out, came back. And if the, um, the earlier signs and symptoms of COVID-19 are not picked up, then it is likely that by the time they get to healthcare facilities, it may be too late. So um, with that, I think I'll end and maybe we can open up to questions because um, I see a number of questions that have been coming in from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Zara for updating us about the in Pakistani perspective. So uh, there are uh, Dr. Rizwan, Dr. Uh, Zara, there are quite a few burning questions and uh, uh, I don't know how would you would like to uh, go one by one to... So, uh, but what, what, yes, what I wanted to do is just to comment a couple of things which uh, Zara has mentioned, that uh, uh, 500, 5,000 tests a day, right? That's the capacity in... About, the yes. So 5,000 tests a day, we do it in one hospital, in my hospital every day, for example. So the scale of testing, you can see it's quite low in Pakistan and that need to be scaled up. And the other important thing you mentioned that uh, we, the reason to do testing is to know silent carriers. And silent carriers, there was a recent, I, I know of this study, there was a small company who, who did uh, about 100 of their employees to, for viral infection by PCR. And 14 of those people were positive by PCR. For so that means that those people are carrying the viruses and if you, and they don't have any symptoms, but when they go home and they have elder parents or people who are immunocompromised, those are the people at the highest risk. And we need, we need to recognize that. And only way to recognize is to know if the testing is done. So let's go with the question. I think uh, those were two comments, but testing need to increase in Pakistan. So uh, first question was really, uh, there was, uh, uh, let's start with the beginning. Uh, Shahid, Dr. Shahid, you want to go and uh, select some questions or should we do it? 
I see. Uh, can I answer a couple of questions that sure. I thought flash up? Yes. Because I think um, it would be best if uh, you know you yeah, pick I, up. I saw. Move on. Yeah. I saw a couple of questions uh, that I would like to respond to. One of them was, um, can you get an antibody test and be safe and then go to work? Um, and I think that we have been trying to say that no, the antibody test will not give you a immunity passport. It will only tell you, um, because if it's negative, it doesn't mean anything. Um, and if it's positive, you don't know where in the disease you are. So in fact, if you want to determine infectivity, it is only the PCR test that will tell you in that time if you're carrying virus. So the other question was, recent question was false positive, false negative, and sensitivity. So remember, any of these tests, like any other pathology test, they all have false positive rate, they all have false negative rate, and false negativity can, comes from number one, if you have enough sample, number two, if sample is kept properly, number three, are your machines are working properly. So there are many different ways you can have a false negative test. And false positive usually happens if you have a similar type of target in your specimen, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is, which is which your PCR primers are amplifying. So in this case, these primers are very specific as I've shown that slide that even if you have one target or two target target, the specificity is very good with PCR testing. Same method, same thing goes with the antibody testing. If you are, you are identifying the antibody against the virus, if you have a similar type of virus and your antibody is not specific, you may have a false uh, false positive and false negative is also again from sample collection from uh, uh, how the sample is kept and the stage of the disease these things all matter so i would say wherever your testing is done just ask that specific lab that what is their false positive and false negative rate okay you want to pick up another question sarah yeah. I think somebody asked about nasopharyngeal swab and how it works. Um, these details are available online, very nice videos uh, demonstrating how different swabs can be used. Also information about comparisons as to nasopharyngeal swab specimens compared with nasal specimens, compared with oral specimens, so they all work. Um, and uh, now the new thing is self-collection of specimens because when uh, I'd like to bring up that sampling has its own challenges with regard to the healthcare worker and exposure. We haven't talked about PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, equip, equipment that is required um, when uh, healthcare workers um, see patients and how they need to wear the gowns and the masks to protect them. And even when they're sampling, they must be sampled with care. They need to have, um, N95 masks and a face shield. Um, these issues with PPE and availability of PPE have been global issues and um, have resulted in, for the first time, people having to reuse masks and reuse gowns, even, even I believe in the US where um, there used to be an abundance of PPE. And in Pakistan, certainly, there hasn't been enough PPE for healthcare workers in all the hospitals. And now they've been scaled up, but, but they remain uh, very, very important commodities. So coming back to relevance to testing, um, hopefully once we can get self-sampling, which is basically taking uh, a swab and uh, sampling both nostrils at the same time and then putting it in your transport medium and sending it to the lab, that will ease up some of the bottlenecks with testing. So I will pick up the next one, and uh, there's a question about uh, what is criteria for being exposed, that who is exposed and so on. So again, the initially, uh, the suggestion was that you stay at six feet of difference. I would say like uh, if you extend your hand, for example, another person also extend hand. If you are, if you're, if you are talking to someone with Two hand distance, probably you are okay. But again, there is a uh, there was uh, now the uh, 
guidelines have changed again about using masks. Initially, it was thought that masks may not be needed. And I believe the, re the reason was there was not enough mask available to provide to whole world population. So they have to come up with distance rather than mask. Mask is always helpful, it is very helpful. So whenever you are in a group setting where you can see that uh, uh, if nothing else, you will uh, stop spreading to others and, and vice versa. So mask is very important and about six feet of distance is a good criteria. Again, if you are a very highly infected, if you're close to someone who has a high virus load, you have a higher chance of getting that infection. And we haven't talked about virus load, but that is also going to be, we don't do that at present, but that's going to be an important criteria as we move forward. Dr. Rizwan, there was a question on pool testing. Would you like to talk about that? Which because testing? Because PCR pooling. Yes, so that's a very good question, as a matter of fact, for screening testing, as we used to do for blood uh, transfusion. So in blood transfusion, what you do is rather than testing one blood sample at a time, you pool 20 or 30 or 40 blood samples and run your uh, uh, battery of tests. And if there's a positive, then you start uh, 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 identifying that patient, that, 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 uh, that group and individually test it. So if uh, in, virus low in virus testing also, yes, if you, if, you, if you batch it with 20 samples at a time, and many of the batches will be negative, so you don't have to, you can save a lot of money with that, uh, with that 20 test. And in, in cases where you have a positive, you go back to that batch and start uh, testing individually. So that's a good concept, especially in low prevalence areas where you don't see a lot of uh, infections. Can I add to that, that it would need to be validated carefully as to how many samples can be pooled and also depending on the test systems because people's testing systems and their level of sensitivity varies a lot. So, um, you know, high throughput, highly sensitive systems, you don't want to be missing the low viral load because you don't know what stage of disease you're measuring someone. And if you were to miss someone with a viral load less than or 50 or so in one and in a that gets mixed up in a large pool, um, it, it may be problematic. So it needs to be validated very carefully. So there's a question about, uh, about uh, there's a recent Chinese report with the uh, with, uh, virus in semen samples. So my comment to that is, the, so it, can it be a sexually transmit, transmitted disease like HIV? So my answer to that is that wherever this virus is, if it's in blood, the blood can be contaminated can be can be a source if it's in semen it will be uh, a source also it has also been seen in stool samples so there is a lot of questions about this uh, sewage going on uh, and testing uh, population studies by this, those uh, sewage uh, uh, depositories and see what's going on so this this is a new what you call uh, 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 area we are exploring every day and you will see more and more reports, more and more uh, uh, issues related to how this virus can be transmitted. So there's a question, what is the case of getting reinfected with COVID-2? So uh, I, I, I take that question very similar to influenza or any other uh, 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 flu type of symptoms. So if you have a flu this year, are you protected for the flu next year? No, you can get a flu again next year because that's a similar type of virus. And so what it really does is that uh, uh, once you have a, a vaccine, then you have a better protection mechanism. Other than that, you, you may or may not have some protection uh, and many people, many reports, there are many reports out there where there is a reinfection of COVID uh, and people, we have seen that. So reinfection, yes, it is possible. Uh, 
Um, I think Dr. Natasha has asked a question about importance of validation of tests before used in the lab. Thank you, Natasha, for asking that. It absolutely, this is like every other test. Um, it, you know, it, you can't just open the box and, and run it. Um, there need to be um, very uh, planned protocols of testing both positive and negative samples to make sure that your testing is accurate. And um, all over the world, because of the shortage of tests and the, the, um, you know, the concern about the disease, a lot of uh, guidelines have been bypassed in people's urgency to roll out testing quickly. But this can be hugely problematic because without making sure that your testing is robust, uh, one can run the risk of giving both false positive and false negative results. And on a technical note, I would like to say that laboratories that are running high volumes of tests should also make sure that they don't have contamination issues because like you can end up with um, RNA hanging about or um, contamination of, from PCR products for any test, as we do more and more tests, this is something that one has to be very watchful of, um, both from the uh, infectious angle of testing of the sample and also with regard to the accuracy and reliability of the testing. So another very, very uh, uh, good question from our esteemed colleague, Dr. Natasha in Lahore. So do you think there is a, some hesitance in, in general public to be tested, especially if they have mild symptoms? So as I mentioned earlier, having mild symptom doesn't mean that you cannot infect others or you, can, you are not a transmit or carrier for that. So many we have seen in US and there are many reports. Uh, as I mentioned, there was one small study done in one uh, of a private uh, company that X number of uh, employees who are coming to work are positive by PCR. So even if you are symptomless and you think that you are exposed to a virus positive patient, you should get tested because testing positive is not only for yourself, but also how to protect others, especially the immunocompromised people and older people in your uh, uh, in contact. There's a question here about a positive patient wearing a mask and uh, is he not repeatedly reinfecting himself? So he is already infecting himself. He's infected, so there's no question of reinfecting himself, but it's important for him to stop transmitting his virus. So it is very important that he wear a mask and ideally change the mask regularly, if possible, daily, so that the inside of the mask is not contaminated. But it's better that he not pass his virus on. So there's two similar, there are two similar questions because if I, I am infected, if someone is infected, so, uh, and then, uh, then, uh, then how long can I be transmitting virus to others. So they say it's at least 14 days, but I would say it's safe to be isolated for 21 days. And then also that, uh, you need to see if your uh, virus is subsided or PCR negative. We, in US, we have two criteria, symptom free for 21 days or uh, symptom free for a few days and virus initial diagnosis uh, of, of uh, 14 to 21 days. And then also, if you have a positive uh, antibody test, that's a reassurance. But at least though, those two negative PCR tests is one of the important criteria. So another good question is how long the PCR can be positive after the infection? That's a, that's a very important question because uh, what remember what PCR is diagnosing or detecting is virus DNA or virus RNA, not if it is infected or it is causing a disease or it, it may be a dead virus, but is still circulating or present in that sample and can give you a positive. So false positive in a sense that it, it, it the, the PCR machine just look for a piece of DNA, very small piece of RNA in DNA, and not for its pathogenicity. 
Yes, and, and the virus will be shed in biological um, samples from the host that's infected, as Dr. Izvan just said. So it's not a matter of just continuing to transmit through respiratory specimens, but through other body fluids as well. So th th there's another question, there's another question, follow-up question for, you know, the, the, the sample, uh, semen sample reported. So again, we have seen that as recently as yesterday, and there's a, a JAMA report out also, that it's not only lungs who, which are affected in this virus. They are kidneys, GI tract, nervous system, and so on and so on. So what it means that blood is going to, uh, sorry, virus is going through blood to different organs to make them compromise also. So it's not just lungs uh, problem, it's a problem with all body systems. There is a question for Shahid uh, Parvez Saab. Histopathologically, what do you see in COVID in lungs? How do they look like? That's a good question. Am I easy? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, when here in Pakistan, we don't do autopsies, but uh, the Royal College of Pathologists, you know, men, which uh, many of us are fellows, they are doing this and they have requested all over the world to share findings, you know, uh, with the Royal College. And soon uh, a report, a comprehensive report is expected. So it's a little premature, you know, when uh, obviously uh, the full fledged findings, but uh, it's coming, yeah. Hmm. I don't think I've seen any more questions and let me check the chat box. It is five more questions. Uh, finally, just a couple of things, you know, if you can elaborate, uh, Dr. Zara, about, you know, IgG versus IgM, you know, the significance of... Okay, this. thank and, you. Uh, yeah, first. So, so there are two kinds of tests. Um, one of them, when they introduce them, the point of care test is the one that is uh, most tempting for people to use because it seems simple, that it's a finger prick test with a cartridge. And those come um, in two kinds. Either they will identify IgG and IgM separately, or they will identify total antibody together. So generally speaking, the tests that are identifying total antibody are more sensitive than the ones that are identifying IgG and IgM separately, especially when you're talking about rapid tests, okay? Um, the role of IgM and IgG is different. Generally, IgM is the first defender, so it comes up first, but it's IgG that is associated with protective immunity. Having said that, we do not know how the IgG is related to immunity in SARS-CoV infections today, so which is why it is not possible to say that people with IgG have neutralizing antibodies. So neutralizing antibody is an IgG that will bind the virus and kill it. So unless you were to do that test, you could not determine whether your IgG is completely protective. So right. we can only speculate All right. that if you have That's antibody, you can right. speculate that you may have IgG that may be protective, mm -hmm. which so is sorry. why, yes? Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we are talking a lot about antibodies. I don't think Dr. Uh, Zara, you showed in your slide the, pers the, 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 the percentage of, you know, the gender, gender bias, you know, when, uh, I think in Pakistan, one study showed a very high, you know, totally squid towards males. It is, it is, a, it is a, a global thing. thing. Yeah, that's yeah. a novel thing. We have one study out from India, actually, that clearance of virus is much slower in male population than in female population. So yes. the males are a, a absolutely more vulnerable and virus stays longer in males versus females. And also, I think uh, we know for a long time that... Uh, because females have two X chromosomes and some important genes which elicit immune response, they, they reside on X chromosome. 
So though one X chromosome in females it kind of becomes non-functional, but not in total. So somehow females probably elicit better immune response, but that's a flip side too. If it becomes too, you know, like inflammation, double-edged sword, you know, if immune response is too strong, you know, that's also bad, you know, that's why female have much more autoimmune diseases than males. And uh, again, in this case, you know, when the, uh, the hyper, the cytokine is strong, the, the, the uh, overkill, you know, by the our immune system, you know. And so Yes, they're absolutely right. Uh, most of the death we see here is because of cytochrome storm syndrome. Suddenly your body secretes so much uh, cytochromes that uh, most of the organs just succumb to that and can't survive. So there's another question about how far apart negative PCR tests should be. So in our hospital, we do consecutive two days of, uh, of testing to, uh, for negative testing, just to eliminate if there's any false negative. So one day after the other. And there's another question about, is this uh, reasonable to believe that Pakistan either has a milder form of the disease or uh, what's happening in Pakistani population. So time will tell. Yes, uh, in Pakistan, what um, you know, I lived uh, half of my life in Pakistan. So there are not many people go to hospitals if they suddenly die at home. And, uh, and the reporting mechanism and the testing, number of tests done, and so on and so on. There's, there are so many, so many unknown, but we also believe that uh, uh, India and Pakistan, both population are exposed to some type of uh, uh, immunity, uh, hopefully, and uh, hopefully that's true. And, and they, the virus is not causing that much damage as it has caused in, Aust in uh, Western Europe and America. Right, I think uh, if uh, there are no more questions, then a very big thank you to Professor Rizwan Naim, you know, uh, apna, apna merit, you know, to be so kind because to find some credible information, you know, uh, obviously knowledge is highly accessible, very cheap, but to find the credible, you know, to the point focused information is very difficult. And that's what this today's session has been about it. So thanks. A big and, thanks, and, apna. And, Professor uh, Rizwan, others, Professor Zara, yeah. I want and to thank Edelbert's, you, yeah. the three prominent organizations who come together and did this program, uh, APNA Merit, uh, Association of Molecular Pathology Pakistan and Pakistan Association of Pathologists. And, and I've seen that almost 70 uh, participant, live participants participated, which is an amazing number of healthcare providers who are interested in these type of sessions. So thank you, Shahid Rafiq and Apna Merit team for doing a wonderful uh, program and good office. Good office. Thank you very much. Thank you.